Rocketry is tough, and oftentimes if everything is not exactly right, the worst can happen. An explosion! This is certainly one of the things that keeps propulsion engineering and rocketry quite interesting. And it can even be pretty exciting at the amateur levels of rocketry too. So without further ado, let's get into some of the biggest explosions in the history of amateur rocketry. Before we start, I should point out that just because there's an explosion, this doesn't necessarily mean that the whole testing campaign is a failure. Oftentimes testing is actually attempting to reveal the problems that an explosion is showing. And although explosions may not be the ideal or preferred conclusion to a testing campaign, they certainly are great learning opportunities. And one thing that you'll notice about this video is that oftentimes the biggest explosions happen just before some of the greatest successes in amateur rocketry. So don't let those explosions get you down. They're just part of the process. Up first, we have a rocket that was built back in 2019 by CU Sounding Rockets. They're an amateur rocketry group that was founded at the University of Colorado with the express goal of trying to build a rocket which goes to the Kármán line. That's right, they're another one of the groups that's trying to get to space. But of course, with that, there come some challenges. The rocket that they were developing in 2019 was called Cobra and was a solid rocket, which unfortunately met an untimely demise. Its design basically had a three segment solid motor which was placed into the propulsion section of the vehicle and then this was bolted to the main aero frame and that is what carried the rest of the rocket which included the avionics and the recovery package. In order to contain the solid rockets and the combustion reaction contained within, you usually need to have some sort of bulkhead design which keeps in the pressure and directs the flow of the exhaust to the nozzle. However, in this case, this is actually the part of the rocket that ended up failing. The bolts which connect the bulkhead to the motor casing actually ended up shearing, which caused that bulkhead to become removed from the motor casing. Then hot propulsion gases escaped into the rocket, causing it to split kind of into two, and having the aero piece go shooting off, and the motor kind of just fell to the ground. This wasn't a super explosive failure, but certainly an interesting one. Despite the fact that they had this failure somewhat early on in their campaign of building rockets, CU Sounding Rocketry was able to improve on their design and finally build the Obsidian rocket, which just launched this past April. With Obsidian, they are able to reach a maximum altitude of 9,800 meters, which still stands as the second highest launch this year. So, looking pretty good for that future development. And we're definitely looking forward to see what comes next on their campaign to go to space. Also, this just goes to show you that just because you have a failure doesn't mean that that stops your program. Usually it means that, hey, here's some new things that you can learn and build an even better rocket later on. Up next, we don't actually have a rocket which was launched, but one that was just on the testing stand called Belerian. It's built by a group called the USC Liquid Propulsion Lab, which is kind of affiliated with the Rocket Propulsion Lab, but focuses more on just liquid rockets. Belerian is a rocket that is actually utilizing liquid oxygen and kerosene, which is the common fuels that are used in professional systems. The thrust that Belerian is going for is about 10 kilonewtons, and it's driving this all with basically a pressure-fed system. And also, they're actually using what's called regenerative cooling on this rocket, which means that they're taking the fuel and they're pumping it through the nozzle before they set it into the combustion chamber, and the reason for that is to cool down the nozzle so that it doesn't melt. This is basically what professional rockets are doing in order to get higher temperatures in their combustion chamber without actually melting the material that the combustion chamber is made out of. So really awesome stuff that's happening at the Liquid Propulsion Lab. So what happened with their first test of this Valerian engine? Unfortunately, the test didn't quite go according to plan, but at least the whole test stand didn't blow up in their face. Basically what happened here is that there's a flange that connects the nozzle piece to the combustion chamber itself. And we can see from the footage that it's at this flange where basically the whole test stand fails and a bunch of the gases that were supposed to go through the nozzle end up kind of going all over the place instead. And that of course kind of makes it look like basically a big fireball. But maybe that's what they were going for, because the rocket's called Belerion, and that's a dragon's name, and it kind of looks like a dragon flame when it's all running and having all those gases escape. So, who knows? <laughs> maybe they're expecting this. So, the solution to getting Belerion working a bit better, I guess, is just to either 
Think about replacing that flange. I hate flanges. Flanges and seals are a nightmare. Or maybe they have to think about tightening up those connections or potentially using different materials for the seal of the, of the flange because sometimes that could be a, a hard point. Remember, the temperature inside that combustion chamber is like 3000 Kelvin, so there's not really many seal types that can survive that. Next up, we have a rocket called the DHX-400 Nimbus, which was developed by the D.A.R.E. team. They're a group out of Delft University, which is specifically focused on getting a rocket to the Kármán line, and the DHX-400 Nimbus is the engine that they're going to use to get there. Or at least it was the engine that they were using. Now they've kind of switched over to using liquid propulsion instead. The DHX-400 Nimbus is actually a really interesting hybrid rocket because it's using paraffin wax and nitrous oxide in order to power its systems, which is very similar to the one that Astra's building right now. So as you may find out, we actually took a lot of inspiration from this rocket in order to design our own hybrid rocket that we're using to hopefully get us to the Kármán line in the coming years. They had a little bit of problems on their first attempt to light this rocket as we see in the following footage. Because of the over-engineering of the test stand, they were actually able to avoid this engine problem from becoming a full-on failure. Also, it's a unique feature of the hybrid rocket that allowed them to prevent this from becoming a full failure as well. Because there's a liquid oxidizer and a solid fuel, basically all you need to do to turn off the rocket is stop the flow of oxidizer to the combustion chamber. With a solid rocket, this wouldn't really be possible because the fuel and the oxidizer are all entrained in the solid grain of the rocket motor itself which means that once you start it, there's really no way to stop it. Dare used the characteristics of a hybrid rocket in order to stop this from actually becoming a failure because I simply turned off the flow of oxidizer as soon as it looked like the casing was starting to fail, which is basically what's happening when we see all of a sudden a second rocket kind of shooting off to the side there. That was basically the combustion casing failing and that could lead to an explosion. The most likely reason for a failure of this nature is a failure of the insulation inside of the combustion chamber. And this usually happens when the fuel grain itself actually erodes a little bit unevenly throughout the burn, which can expose some layers of the insulation early in the burn. The result of this, of course, can be that that insulation can fail and then you have a potential for a combustion case and failure. Dare was able to finally get this engine working and it actually ended up being what powered their Stratos 3 on their attempt back in 2018 to get to the Carmen line. But unfortunately, this didn't quite end in the success that they wanted because of a breakup of the vehicle about 20 seconds into the flight. And the reason for this was actually caused by something called roll pitch instability. So what does that mean? It's actually a bit of a complex aerodynamic phenomenon that's caused because of the uh, coinciding of the natural frequency of the rocket itself in its, uh, in its bending moment and the rolling frequency that the rocket is using in order to stabilize itself. Oftentimes, amateur rockets are using spin stabilization in order to keep themselves stable and pointing in one direction. But the problem with this is that in order to generate that spin, you need to basically angle the fins to, to, to get that going. And the faster you go, the faster that spin starts going as you go up and you ascend through the atmosphere. And what can actually end up happening is if that spin rate becomes equal with the natural frequency of your rocket, you can get some instabilities where the nose starts wobbling around and then that can essentially cause there to be high angles of attack on the vehicle, which can essentially rip apart the structure and cause a failure like this. But this isn't deterring the D.A.R.E. team. They're looking to keep running for the Carmen line using their liquid rockets. And so I'm really excited to see what happens in the coming years with their efforts. Next up, we have a group called the San Diego State University Rocket Project. If you've watched our video about liquid rocket records, you might know this group as being one of the premier groups fighting for the liquid rocketry record in the amateur community today. As in most cases though, SDSU's success in the last few years has come after many many years of failure. There's no failure, only opportunities. Their group has been building rockets since 2004, with varying degrees of success. One of the first launches was Phoenix 1, which was basically a solid rocket that kind of got off the rail and didn't quite go much further after that. <laughs> the reason for this is that the rocket basically ignited, but the propulsion was not stable and essentially blew itself out. So, ugh, not very good. <laughs> This caused the rocket to lose thrust and essentially crash and burn. But that didn't deter the SDSU team. They got right back out to the launch stand with Phoenix 2. Unfortunately, this rocket had maybe even less success as they didn't even get off the rail. Upon ignition of the rocket, the whole thing basically burst into flames as the reaction was not contained to the combustion chamber itself. So unfortunately, that was basically the end of the Phoenix 2. But it wasn't the end of the Phoenix program itself. 
The next year they came back with Delta Phoenix, which was finally able to ascend into the heavens and get a little bit of altitude. Unfortunately the stability of the vehicle was not good, as you can tell by the footage it wasn't actually spinning, so this allowed the inconsistencies in the thrust, which wasn't pointing exactly down, to build up over time and essentially send the rocket in a very different direction from the upwards direction that they actually wanted to go. <laughs> But still pretty successful, considering that they finally were able to get a rocket off the launch tower and actually into the air. The whole Phoenix program was actually really cool, because it was the first program that was actually utilizing liquids for a student rocketry group. Liquids are a bit more complex than solids, because you actually have to have two fluids which are flowing into the combustion chamber, and getting that working right can be a little bit challenging. You need to have things like injectors and valves and uh, pressure differentials, and they have to have it all working right, otherwise the whole thing goes kaboom! SDSU Rocket Project had a few other blips along the way as they were developing their liquid rockets, but finally, in the last couple of years, they were able to really get it right with the Lady Elizabeth rocket. This is the latest iteration of their liquid rocket technology, which was able to actually break a record for launch and recovery at the time of its launching. They reached a final altitude of just under 4,000 meters, which really marks them as one of the premier liquid propulsion groups in the world today. And guess what? They're looking to use this technology to finally go for the Carmen line, with their next rocket called the Carmen San Diego, which is actually maybe one of my favorites on the list, just because it has a really cool name. <laughs> All rockets that are going to the Carmen line should have really, really cool names. I think this is important. So we're looking forward to some of the details about their testing campaign and eventually the launch of this new rocket called the Carmen San Diego. And if they can pull this off, they'll be the first group to get to the Carmen line using liquid rockets, and they'll definitely blow the liquid rocketry record right out of the water. So really looking forward to that. And what a story that would be from their rich history of developing liquid rockets, being one of the first groups to do so, and then finally being able to pull off this amazing achievement. It just goes to show you that big things really do have small beginnings. And if you just get out there and try and try and try, you're gonna learn stuff, and eventually you're gonna be somewhere where you're able to do some pretty cool stuff. Next up, we have another testament to the value of keeping at it and sticking to your goals. The USC Rocket Propulsion Lab definitely had their challenges while they were developing their rocket to go to the Carmen line. Their first attempt, called Traveler 1, was a solid rocket, which was going to be the first rocket to ever reach space. But unfortunately, it didn't quite make it to that destination. In fact, it didn't even quite breach the cloud deck. Unfortunately, the rocket experienced a catastrophic failure only 3.5 seconds into the flight. The reason for this was basically a motor casing burnout, which means that the heat from the combustion reaction actually burned a hole into the combustion chamber and essentially caused the rocket to fail at that point. Actually, the imbalance of thrust that was created in that explosive event actually caused the rocket to go tumbling end over end until it eventually hit the ground and met its final demise. So actually a pretty visually impressive failure. Although maybe not for the engineers that built it, it was probably heart-wrenching. You have stolen my dreams! Yeah, you put all your effort into it and then, ah, you know, it doesn't quite go according to plan. The USC rocket propulsion team was actually able to get back to the desert in 2018 in order to launch their rocket called Traveler 3. This actually ended up going exactly according to plan, but unfortunately the avionics were not on during the launch, so they had no confirmation that they had reached their destination. I just, I keep having this nagging feeling that I've forgotten something. But finally, the USC Rocket Revulsion Lab was able to have success and get their rocket to the carbon line with Traveler 4. And this time, the avionics were turned on. They were able to get to an altitude of 103 kilometers, which makes them the first university team to get to the carbon line. So it just goes to show you that just because you have some mistakes and you have some failures, it doesn't mean that that has to end your program. Instead, these can be valuable learning opportunities that actually push you towards your ultimate goal. And that tenacity is even being carried forward today. They're not done. The Carmen line was not the end destination. The USC Rocket Propulsion Lab is actually going for the ultimate amateur rocketry record, which is set by the GoFast rocket uh, way back in 2015. The GoFast rocket was able to reach an altitude of 117 kilometers, and that stands as the all-time amateur rocketry record. But over the past year, the USC Rocket Propulsion Lab has been specifically working on a rocket which will breach that target. But in order to do this, they have to redesign the whole propulsion section of their solid rocket. And that's what they've been testing over the last couple of months. Unfortunately, they've gone through three iterations of this test stand and haven't really had success to date. So what's going on?
Unfortunately, these failures are largely the result of problems with the actual wrapping process that they're going through. Whenever you're wrapping a pressure vessel, usually the optimum wrapping configuration is to have 54, negative 54 degrees as you wrap the carbon fiber uh, around the tube that you're trying to strengthen. But a combustion chamber is not really a typical pressure vessel. The pressures inside the combustion chamber actually change a lot during the burn with uh, pressures that peak and decay at a rapid rate. So there's lots of dynamic forces that are happening inside the fibers that are strengthening that core. So one of the effects this has is that you actually need to end up having a lot more axial strength than you would expect in a typical pressure vessel, just because of the way the forces are behaving during the dynamic behavior in the burn. And for this reason, they're experiencing some trouble with that wrapping technique that they're using. So fortunately, this has resulted in three rather explosive failures in the last couple of months. But I'm confident that this is just part of the process in developing this higher level technology, and I'm sure they're going to get it right and beat that record pretty soon. Finally, if you're familiar with British television, we have a rocket that was built by the Top Gear engineers. Although they're not a student rocketry group, I thought it would be interesting to talk about them just because of the truly ridiculous rocket that they built that actually ended up not exactly going according to plan either. So they had a great idea of, why don't we just turn a car into a space shuttle? <laughs> Makes for great television, right? So the Top Gear engineers ended up designing what basically was a space shuttle for a little car that is common in the UK called a Reliant. And their goal was to launch the Reliant and actually land it like the space shuttle uh, coming down and landing like a, like a plane. And amazingly, they were actually almost able to do this. The rocket took off just like a space shuttle with the two main boosters and the core stage all firing at once. And they were able to have a clean separation of the rocket boosters and then the Reliant was able to continue upwards with the external fuel tank. But unfortunately, this is where the problem started. With the release of those solid boosters, the asymmetry of the rockets started to compound and basically send the Reliant off in a direction it wasn't supposed to go. And unfortunately, the external tank was unable to separate, which meant that the plane aspect of the vehicle was never able to really be showcased. <laughs> and instead, the whole thing ended up crashing into the side of a hill and uh, <clears throat> ending in a bit of an explosion. Okay, that explosion wasn't exactly the real explosion that was caused, but uh, one that was generated after special effects. But nonetheless, still pretty crazy that uh, amateurs were able to send a car into the sky and then have it crash all the way back down to the ground. <laughs> Literally from like a kilometer high. <laughs> that wasn't flying, that was falling with style. Unfortunately, the top gear team was not able to redesign and optimize in order to fix some of the problems that they had in that first launch. Because who knows, we might have actually had it working successfully then. So I guess we'll never know if a Reliant can fly like a space shuttle. But hey, if you're an ambitious amateur rocketeer and you have a car lying around that's not being used, maybe you could take a shot to see if you can make the car fly. So there you have it, some of the biggest explosions in amateur history. Hopefully these stories inspire you to see some of the biggest failures in your life as learning opportunities that can take you to higher heights in the future. Did we miss any cool stories and explosions that you think should be included? Be sure to let us know in the comments. If you want to see more of this content, be sure to help out the algorithm and subscribe. And remember to expand your horizons.